Summer's over, but uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me along. And I just wish that Lloyd Timberlake uh, could have been here. He's just turned 70. He lives in America. He emailed me just a few minutes ago to say that he's on the beach in Spain with his family. So, so happy birthday, Lloyd. <laughs> but we are all very, very lucky to have such a great teacher. He's one of the leading thinkers in the environmental movement. Do read his text in the exhibition. It, it will change you forever. And, and may I uh, thank you all in advance for, for uh, responding to the questions in, in Whole Earth. Uh, it's, an, it's an exhibition of questions. Not, it's not prescriptive at all. Um, I'll just remind you as well that, that Winston Churchill said, if it's a good idea, it came from Sweden. Uh, so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so universities in the UK I think there are 21 universities that are opening this exhibition at roughly the same time. Uh, universities in, in the UK have, have huge expectations, Umia, uh, so no pressure. Uh, actually, you've already surpassed our expectations. No one else has, has organized anything on this scale, so it, it is really very moving for, for us who've been involved in the exhibition to see the response here. Uh, I understand that, that many of you have come to this project through human rights, uh, and this is perhaps a, a, a more vital uh, entry point to sustainable development than climate change. We, we generally understand human rights as civil and political rights, but the, the UN added a, a second covenant uh, on economic, social, and cultural rights in the 1960s, and this chimes very closely with Whole Earth. The two headline challenges that we face are, are poverty and climate change. And, and let's remember that climate change is handcuffed to poverty. Destabilize the climate and human rights go out the door. All the gains that we've made will be lost. As you know, uh, uh, Whole Earth is a follow-up to Hard Rain. I illustrated Bob Dylan's song with pictures that show our headlong collision with nature. Dylan's lyric brings out the way our global problems are linked by cause and effect, and that they need to be tackled together, not as separate, individual, isolated problems. They're connected. Uh, and I was reminded of this when I heard Hard Rain for the first time. I was lost in the Sahara Desert that desert had been rich agricultural land in the days of the Roman Empire. Even the basic farming techniques practiced hundreds of years ago had a, had a profoundly damaging effect on the land which was turned to desert. We've been in headlong collision with nature for a very long time. In the past, people could migrate when one patch of the earth had been spoilt. We are now all aware of the terrible consequences of war in Syria. It's cause attributed in large measure to climate change by many experts, hundreds of thousands of people. On the move from Syria alone, but an estimated two billion people around the world are migrants, moving from field to favela, and many, of course, move on to Europe and America. We're no longer isolated by nationalism, right? Your generation faced new kind kinds of threats that could permanently damage civilization. We, we have to face this. It's real, it's actual. We have new problems and we have old problems on a new scale, right? But you also have new tools to deal with these problems. In Whole Earth, we show many of these proven solutions that need to be taken to scale. And by the way, many of these new solutions have been developed by universities. Universities are inventing the new sustainable world that might underpin security for all. The question is this, how do you reach the elders in power so that they take these solutions to scale? The elders in power are bestowing the majority of resources on themselves, on their uh, generations, on their healthcare, their security, their pensions. My generation has trashed the prospects for young, for young people. 
Will you follow in our, our footsteps or will you bring about the changes that are so urgently needed? Sweden may have better governance than, than many countries. I, I'm taking a broad view here. But it is as if unsustainability itself had accelerated. The, the acts of governments in the mid-20th century compromised distant future generations. The acts of government leaders today compromise their own children. As Lloyd points out, a new revolution is required to counter the present revolution, the one in which the young go into debt for the old. The new revolution is not going to be run by the elders and current leaders. They built and benefit from the status quo. It will be organized and run by the disaffected. The more powerful among the disaffected are and will be for the foreseeable future. Young people at college with debt with limited job prospects in many parts of the world. Revolution is a, an old-fashioned word. Can you give it a new meaning? Can you move on from the finger-pointing protest movements of the 1960s, which sometimes worked for a single issue? We're not talking about single issues now. We're talking about new values, new ways of working, new kinds of communities, a new approach to nature and to human nature. Is it possible to have Sustainable development based on a, a sustainable development revolution based on rigorous science, carefully thought through values, appropriate for the challenges that we face today. Can you all work with people in the arts to reach a wide public as well as our political leaders? Of course you can. Together, students are a very powerful group and the new SOS Alliance, Students Organizing for Sustainability, is there to make it happen. Don't sit on the fence. It's no fun. And it has no meaning. And without meaning, the brain goes to pieces. Our problems are telling us we can't be ordinary people anymore. Right? You don't want to be ordinary people anymore. Yeah? Very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just checking. <laughs> Universities have got a difficult job. They, they have to do two things. They have to prepare students for the world of work, which means for the most part business as usual, getting a job in the old resource raping economy. They also have to prepare students for the work of the world, which means new ways of thinking, new ways of doing business that aligns human systems and natural systems. The old and the new are going, to be, are going to exist side by side because we're in a transition. This is not a contradiction. It's a transition. I think the environmental movement has damaged its cause by its holier-than-thou attitude. People who would give support to the broad aims driving sustainable development might be alienated by an all-or-nothing approach. The environmental movement has created an us and them, a, a, a way, a, an us and, or, or them way of thinking. If people are made to feel guilty, they'll close off. Can we bring us and them together? After all, we're just people, the same hopes and fears and longings for security for a decent life. Can universities take sustainable development to all disciplines while recognizing that not everyone can work in the sustainable sector? It's not big enough or profitable enough yet. So most people will have to work in the old economy. But those who do so can gently convert their colleagues to sustainable development and support this vital, fascinating transition. As we travel down the tracks to a sustainable world, more and more jobs will open up in the new economy. And we can all campaign for a sustainable world. This is where art meets science, meets philosophy, meets law, meets technology, meets farming, meets political science. It's an all-inclusive party. Years ago, I lived in Christiania. I made a book about the free city in Copenhagen. Uh, they had campaigns every week. And here's one lovely story with a, a, a serious point. OK, it's Christmas time. 400 people from, from Christiania make Father Christmas outfits, put them in shopping bags, head over to the biggest and most expensive store in Copenhagen. They split up onto the seven floors and all go into the toilets. 
They re-emerge at exactly 11 o'clock, a Father Christmas army, <laughs> and walk into the showrooms and start handing out the merchandise to the Christmas shoppers. Here you are, happy Christmas, they said. Have this, have this. <laughs> the, sh <laughs> the shop assistants think that the store had laid on a, a, a secret promotion, and they join in. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, then, and then the shoppers start giving themselves Christmas pre presents and everybody else. <laughs> People are leaving with armfuls of stuff. The, ma the manager realizes something terrible has happened and he calls the police. <laughs> they the police arrive with their blue lights flashing and start to arrest Father Christmases, <laughs> including, including the seven Father Christmases that the shop had employed to give tiny little, <laughs> tiny, little, <laughs> tiny little toys to the children. No, no, don't arrest me. I'm the real father. No, no, we're the real fa Father Christmas. Is. <laughs> 407 Father Christmases <laughs> are arrested and taken to the police station, but they don't fit. They're lined up around the police station. <laughs> and then it's not clear what they've actually done wrong, what they could be charged with. <laughs> so the police had to call lawyers, high-powered lawyers, to figure out what they can charge them with. Now, that's what I call a great campaign because it uses art and humor, uh, and it really makes people think. Uh, and, and hard rain, you know, this exhibition, uh, it, it reached 15 million people on every continent, uh, and, and it even got shown at the UN headquarter building. Uh, and we sent the book to every prime minister and to uh, President Bush as well, all the presidents, including President Bush. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the copy that we sent to President Bush came back three days later. <laughs> it was, the envelope was marked, not known at this address. <laughs> And this brings me uh, to my last point, um, a very important lesson. And I'm going to end as I began with a quote by Winston Churchill. Never, never, never give up. Thank you very much. <laughs>